So I'm very pleased to welcome everyone here this evening to the panel for the IMU's Committee for Women in Mathematics. So I am the vice chair of the CWM and I would like to just briefly introduce our panel here this evening. So first of all, we have Marie-Francoise Ra, who is the chair of CWM, but let me tell you a bit more. She is a emeritus professor from the University of Rennes, and she specializes in real algebraic geometry, and recently she works on algorithms and computational complexity in this subject. Uh, she has also done an enormous amount of things connected with women in mathematics. She was one of the founder members of European Women in Mathematics and also Femme Mat, which is the French association, and she was also one of the driving forces behind the setting up of CWM. And not only that, she uh, has been president of the French Mathematical Society, Société Math de France, and uh, she is a chevalier of the French Légion d'honneur. So I'm going to ask Marie-Francoise to come and tell us a little bit of the background about CWM. So. to just come. Yes, they do it. Yes. No, that's okay. Just, just, okay. Right. Thank you. So, so I don't need to do anything. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that, okay. So that, that, that was not me. <laughs> so I don't need to say. Okay. So um, I, I just want to be, to be giving you a short presentation of... Uh, the Committee for Women in Mathematics of the International Mathematical Union. Okay, so I'm not going to read it, but we have some official terms of references that have been um, given to us by the EC of the IMU when the, when the committee was created, which is a little more than three years ago. So basically, we, we need to promote international contacts between uh, national and regional organizations for women in mathematics, uh, and so on and so on. Okay. Well, we, we are going to post the, the slides so you can read it in more details if you want to do, know everything about our terms of references. Okay, so this is the committee. Uh, so the picture was taken by Alicia Dickenstein uh, in 2015 in uh, Cortona, so it's not, uh, she was attending the meeting with us, so she's not on the picture, and you'll recognize several of us, uh, Caroline, Betul, who's standing here, and probably, well, Carolina, of course, and several uh, people who are in this room. Okay, so... The, the thing we did uh, even before uh, CWM is a website, which is really a unique and uh, important platform for presenting all the activities for women in mathematics worldwide with a lot of information. And the website is updated nearly uh, every week. So really, you, you, should, uh, you should look at it, and the address is here, www.math union.org and just CWM. There are a lot of information there. Okay, we also started the network of 120 so-called CWM ambassadors, and this is basically one person per country, sometimes several persons per country, and this person is in charge of uh, disseminating the information coming from CWM and also sending the information about the initiatives in their country or maybe in their scientific network to CWM so that we can put it on the website. <clears throat> so we can, I think we can say that our main activity has been the support of uh, networks. So we had an annual call where we were asking people to make proposals. And uh, basically, we had, uh, in all the old period, we had 150 proposals, applications, and uh, nearly 30 were founded, were funded, sorry, 
and uh, the, the maximum was uh, three uh, kilo euro for each, but it was really helping a lot for the organization. So just as an example, in 2017, we had meetings in Brazil, Canada, for the Mathematical Congress of the uh, American uh, uh, Association, Chile, India, Nepal, Tunisia, South Africa, Iran, Vietnam, Mexico, Japan. And in, in total, we had around 1,500 uh, participants of all, all these years. And uh, you'll see at, uh, at the end of the, of the panel, we, we've been uh, putting uh, several uh, posters. And these are examples of, of two posters, which have been designed uh, thanks to Betul. And this is per continent, all the places where there are activities uh, taking place. So we have here put Africa and America, but of course there are also activities in Asia and you, you can uh, look at them uh, later tonight. One big thing we've been doing, and probably several of you uh, went there, was the World Meeting for Women in Mathematics, which took place on Tuesday. So it was a satellite event of uh, ICM and around I don't know exactly the numbers because there were some, uh, as you know, some, uh, some network problem, uh, I mean, some internet problem uh, during the, the first days of the meeting. But basically, uh, we think that there are more than 350 participants coming from about 60 different countries. And one third of them, more than one third of them, were in fact people supported by the Open, grant, uh, open Arms Grant Program of the ICM. So we, we insisted on uh, Latino America because uh, the meeting was taking place in, in Brazil. And uh, several of the invited lecturers were coming from Latino America. We had also a keynote speaker and, uh, uh, and a public lecture. And also in the panel, there was uh, especially uh, two of the panelists who were speaking either of uh, the activities in Brazil and uh, the activities in Latin America. So next time, for the next ICM, we hope to have another WM Square, which will take into account the local situation in uh, Russia and, and this part of the world. So we've seen also that we have inclu been including activities uh, for the memory of Mariam Mirzakhani. So there was a part of the, of the meeting which was devoted to this. And now you see also an exhibition. There is a corner uh, in this building on floor one or zero, depending on, on the country, say on floor, on floor zero for the French way of counting the floors. And, uh, and uh, you, you see 15 really beautiful uh, posters and which are really reflecting the personality, work, and life of uh, Maria Mirzakhani. And there is a book where you can uh, write your own condolences or feelings about her. And uh, so I've seen that already many people did it, but please, uh, please do it too. And one also, um, one of the things we we did was the world premiere of the film Journeys of Women in Mathematics. So it was in fact, it's a short movie which was presenting uh, three women. So Nila Nataraj from India, Aminata, uh, Peshu, Aminatou Pesha from Cameroon, and Carolina Araru from, uh, from Brazil. And uh, there will be a second part to this, um, to this film, which is uh, now uh, being uh, well, so it has been filmed during WM Square and uh, the day before and the first day of ICM. And then in a few months from now, we, we can see a complete film with these three ladies in their respective countries coming together here in Rio and then uh, attending to the, to the event. Okay, so given the title of the panel, I want to insist a little more on another aspect of what we are doing, which is uh, the gender gap in science project. So it's a global approach to the gender gap in mathematical, computing, and natural sciences. And the question is how to measure the gender gap and how to reduce it. So it's a big project, uh, which is uh, funded by the uh, 
International Council of Science. And uh, with a lot of partners, we have 11 partners uh, from physics. So, for example, uh, our friend Sylvina is here uh, representing physics, and also uh, a lot of other organizations, including UNESCO. And uh, we, we have also trying to, to have uh, an important focus on developing countries. So we had uh, already three workshops, uh, one in Africa, one in Asia, yes. and one in uh, Latino America. Uh, so again, there is a website, it's called uh, gendergapinscience.org. So we have three activities in this, uh, in this project. So the first activity we call a global survey of scientists. So we are asking scientists, not only women, men and women, to answer a list of questions about uh, their experience as scientists in order to be able to identify maybe some different patterns in the career or access to resources for men and women, but also from different parts of the world and also in the different disciplines also, because the situation of women is not the same in, say, biology and uh, mathematics or computer science. So we would like really to invite you to answer and uh, also ask people you know to answer this questionnaire. So again, uh, you can see the, the website, but it's not difficult if you, if you just type gender gap in science, you will, uh, you will find it. So it is a multilinguistical uh, survey, so you can choose your favorite language in order to, to answer the survey. Okay, the second part of um, this gender gap in science is uh, publication patterns, so I don't have much time, so I'm not going to insist on that. But the idea is to analyze using the database of Central Blatt and others, like Archiv, to analyze what are the publication patterns for men and women. And the third aspect, which I think is very important, is the database of good practices. Because we know that uh, there are so many initiatives for women uh, in mathematics, but maybe uh, not, on, not all of them are so successful, and maybe also some of them can be generalized from an, one country to another. So we want to make such a database. And I'm a little late, so I just want to finish with the gender gap inside ICM which is a big topic, and uh, you can see uh, that uh, that's the patterns of the number of people attending, well, speak, number of female speakers at ICM, their proportion, and you see that it's only in the recent years, very recently, that it's above 10%. And there is a huge gap also between, say, 1932 and uh, the 1960s. So it's really something uh, important, I just show you the first plenary lecture at ICM by Amy Notaire, and the second plenary lecture at ICM nearly 60 years later by Karen Ullenbeck. Well, thank you. So our next speaker is June Barrow-Green, who comes from the Open University in England, in the United Kingdom, and she's a professor of mathematics, but she specializes in history of mathematics, especially mathematics of the sort of turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And she's worked on Poincaré, and she's now working on Birkhoff, so things about dynamical systems. So she's going to talk to us on a topic which I think is exceedingly important to keep in mind and understand when we are discussing these issues, which is the historical context of the gender gap in mathematics. So June, please. Um, thank you. So, the, um, so I'm really beginning from the, um, in the modern period, and so we need to have a starting point, and the obvious starting point is Maria Agnesi. She, um, she is known because she produced um, a textbook, uh, a calculus textbook, which was published in 1748. And as a result of this textbook, it's really the first kind of calculus textbook that deals with um, uh, differentiation and integration. And um, actually, she produced it to um, support her younger brothers in, in learning mathematics. Um, 
Uh, she was uh, appointed to the chair of mathematics in Bologna in 1750, but she never took it up. And she never even went to Bologna, in fact. She, she came from Milan. So although she has this title, she never was actually what I would consider um, a professional woman mathematician. And so my, my talk is really about the difficulties for women becoming professional uh, mathematicians um, and, and looking at women who push the subject forward, who are involved in the development of mathematics. Now there are of course a lot of women who are also in the period that I'm going to be discussing are doing mathematics. They may be doing mathematics from the point of view of maybe running the household accounts or something like that. And I, don't, I do not for one minute wish to diminish the contribution that these women have made. But I have to make a selection and this is the, the selection I, ha I have chosen. So um, if we look in the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, I put a selection up on the, on, um, on the slide here. Um, and I think you can see, if you just look at these pictures, it's very obvious that they come from a particular social class. Um, their, their clothes rather betray <laughs> where, where they come from. Now, you may well have heard of, of three of them, um, uh, Emily de Chatelet, uh, um, Ada Lovelace, and Mary Somerville, but possibly you haven't heard of Elizabeth Ferrand. Now, I've put her picture up because, not because she was somebody who pushed mathematics forward, but because I find it very interesting that a woman in France in the um, 18th century chooses to have her portrait painted with her, the sort of symbol that she wishes to kind of have associated with her is Newton's Principia. That is the book behind her. And, and what this tells us, actually, it's part of a story of women in the uh, 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, were able to engage in mathematics. They were able to engage in the discourse. And in Emily de Chatelet's case, um, actually do mathematics. She, her translation of Newton's Principia into French is still the standard translation today. Um, and she uh, embellished it with commentaries of her own and so on. So they could actually do mathematics. They could be part of the discourse, um, and, um, but what they couldn't be was professional in a sense that they, there were places that were not open to them. Um, so they learnt mathematics. So Ada Lovelace, for instance, her mother encouraged her to do mathematics. So it wasn't a question that they weren't um, supported in some sense in doing mathematics. But as I say, these doors that were close to them, and Mary Somerville exemplifies this um, in um, her relationship with the Royal Society. Uh, she's the first woman to have a paper published by the Royal Society and um, she had her, her book, The Mechanism of the Heavens, was a textbook which was actually taken up by Cambridge University um, for their mathematical tripos, but she could not become a fellow of the Royal Society. I mean, that just was not even considered. Um, and that's what I mean about women, the kind of barriers for women being part of professional um, organizations. And in fact, as far as the Royal Society is concerned, um, Hertha Ayrton, at the beginning of the 20th century, was formally proposed to be a, a fellow of the Royal Society, um, supported by, obviously, only men. Um, and one of the reasons she was rejected was because she was a married woman, and as such, she had no status in law, so that was very easy to dispose of her application. I mean, it seems shocking to us today. Um, the first woman to become uh, members, fellows of the Royal Society was 1945, and the first uh, woman mathematician was Mary Cartwright in 1947. Um, and there haven't been very many since, and I'm delighted Caroline is, is one of the few representatives of uh, female mathematicians in the, in the Royal Society. Um, so, moving on. Um, Sofia Kovalevskaya um, is, I would consider, the first woman who really had a career and it was kind of professional in the sense that she had a chair of mathematics, she earned her living as a math mathematician, and she did very high-class mathematics. Uh, she studied with Weierstrass in Berlin. She wasn't allowed to attend the lectures of the university, but she did get a PhD at Göttingen um, in absentia. She had, the papers were sent and it was kind of negotiated with Göttingen that she could get a PhD. Um, but she still 
Um, she hankered after having a position in Paris um, or, uh, or Germany, and particularly in Paris. And she was accepted by the, the French mathematicians. She won um, the Prix Bourdin of the uh, French Academy of Sciences. So they recognized her, they accepted her as a mathematician in that sense. But there was simply no chance for her to have a position in Paris. That is just, it was beyond um, what they could conceive of. Um, so she had her position in Stockholm. She was championed by Mutag Leffler, um, but he, he met a lot of opposition. So it was actually to his credit that he got her um, the position. And one of the things I put up on the slide here, you can see this remark about her, her looks. And this remark was made by um, James Joseph Sylvester's assistant when he saw a photograph of her. Um, uh, why, this is the first handsome mathematical lady I have seen. Now, of course, one might wonder how many mathematical ladies he'd seen. Um, but actually, you see quite a lot of comments about her looks um, when she was alive. She dies prematurely young, sort of tragically. After she dies, there's a lot of... Um, a lot is written about her, and there, a lot is written about her looks, both positive and negative. There isn't a kind of consensus, but her looks are very much part of the discourse. So this is something else that really comes into play. Um, and um, the prejudice that she, she met, and this is um, uh, from her own words, she, when she was still quite young in her um, career, she goes to London, and she's in the salon of George... Um, Eliot, the, the novelist, um, and um, she, when she's there, um, George Eliot, who actually was quite well versed in mathematics and was interested in mathematics, she studied mathematics in London, she includes some mathematics in her novels, and um, she was very keen for uh, Kovalevskaya to meet Herbert Spencer, this philosopher, and um, as he said, um, and this is uh, Kovalevskaya reporting, I'm so glad you have come today, this is um, uh, George Eliot, I can introduce you to the living refutation of your theory, a woman mathematician, allow me to present my friend, she continued, uh, turning to me without mentioning my name, only I have to warn you, he does not believe in the existence of a woman mathematician. So, I mean, this is really, um, uh, it's, it's, as I say, it's, I mean, I, I just find it quite extra hard to kind of cope with myself reading this now. But, um, you know, this isn't so long ago in, in the kind of um, historical terms. We're, we're talking only um, 1869. Um, and um, so I want to move from Kovalevskaya and move to Cambridge in the 19th century. And here we have an image of what um, uh, the, Girton, uh, the Girton girl, and you can see this kind of riff on, on mathematics, a single figure. Um, so this is clearly a, a, a Girton girl was a, a girl doing mathematics, and it was clearly someone who was supposed to be single. Um, and there's this other quote. Out of every 100 women, roughly speaking, 96 have husbands provided for them by nature. Only four need go into a nunnery or take to teaching higher mathematics. Um, so, you know, I, I, I just can't emphasize enough how, how deeply these, these things were kind of entrenched at the end of the 19th century. Um, and the first woman to be successful in the mathematical tripos in Cambridge in 1880, Charlotte Scott, um, the mathematical tripos was the kind of epitome of mathematical exams to be successful in the tripos, opened doors to you anywhere as a, a male mathematician, the senior wrangler, the top student could basically, they were celebrated, um, the, the results were published uh, uh, nationally, um, they were, it wasn't just a local, a local thing. And so when Charlotte Scott was um, a, a equivalent to the eighth wrangler, she was given permission to sit the exam, she couldn't take the exam by right, um, there was a huge, um, it was a sensation, absolute sensation. They didn't believe women could do anything like that. And she, was, she had pretty formidable company with her. You can see she had Joseph Larmore, became Lucasian professor, J.J. Thompson, who, who won a Nobel Prize. But if you read the things that were written um, as a result, and this is just one of them, um, where it says she answers the papers and so on, um, we hope that the ability which the new system brings out and fosters in women will not be of a kind to give to those who possess it a character for deficiency in feminine gentleness. We do not believe that it will, will do so, but even in the rare cases where it is so, the world should remember that there have always been women of the masculine type. Um, I don't think I need to say more. 
Um, uh, ten years later, Philippa Fawcett becomes above the senior wrangler. And um, so if Charlotte Scott was a sensation, Philippa Fawcett was a, a super sensation. But, and by this time, women could sit the exam by rights. They could not get degrees. Um, and um, they, they, they could not have their, they were allowed to have their results published after Charlotte Scott. But remember, she is above the senior wrangler. But look where she is in the list, below the senior wrangler. Um, so the women were not, their results were not published with the men. Um, and so all these things that just kind of go and emphasize the extent to which women are not considered to be really part of the mathematical culture in the same way um, that men are. And if we look at Cambridge, it's not until 1947 that women um, gain degrees, are allowed to have degrees um, uh, in, in Cambridge. And there was a, a, a big push after Philippa Fawcett, but it was not enough. Um, and the men felt threatened. Um, and uh, although there were, you could get degrees in London, and then in 1920, Oxford opened their doors, but uh, Cambridge didn't because they said, well, if women want to get degrees, um, they can go to Oxford. So, um, and the, those cartoons just go to show the kind of um, uh, what was going on when they had the vote to see whether women could have uh, degrees, and that was in 1897. Um, so, um, uh, Mary Francois mentioned the uh, project about um, looking at publication patterns, and this has a long history too. So, this is a quote from um, uh, a letter William Young wrote to Grace. Uh, Chisholm Young, his wife, Grace, Grace Chisholm had um, been successful in the Tripos. She'd gone to Germany and had got a PhD under Felix Klein um, and had come back and married William Young, who'd been her tutor at Cambridge. And this is a letter that he wrote to her in 1902. The fact is that our papers ought to be published under our joint names. But if this were done, neither of us would get the benefit of it. No, mine the laurels now and the knowledge. Yours the knowledge only everything under my name now, and later when the loaves and fishes are no more procurable in that way, everything or much, um, or much under your name. Um, so th this is, you know, as I say, emphasizing the kind of, um, the, the really deeply entrenched attitudes towards um, publication um, by women. Um, so I want to move to Germany um, very quickly. This is a quote from Immanuel Kant, just to show um, the, again, the length of, of um, uh, sort of prejudice in a sense against women. And this, is, this quote says, a woman who has a head full of Greek or carries on fundamental controversies about mechanics, like the Marquis de Chatelet, might as well even have a beard. A woman, therefore, will learn no geometry of the principles of sufficient reason, or the moment she will monad, she will know only so much is um, uh, needed to perceive the salt in the satyr. The fair can leave Descartes in his vortices to world forever without troubling themselves about them. And in fact, what Kant is saying here, he's saying basically, if a woman is doing this kind of thing, then actually they're not really a woman, they're a man. Um, that's, that is actually what's kind of behind this. Um, we go a little bit, uh, we leap forward in time and we go to Felix Klein. And um, Felix Klein was a supporter of, of, of women in mathematics. He was asked for his opinions in um, 1896 about women um, studying mathematics. Um, and he says, the opinion still prevailing in Germany is that the study of mathematics must be as good as inaccessible to women, that there should be an essential blockade to any efforts directed towards the development of women's higher education. And then he goes on to say that he has, actually he does have half a dozen women studying with him, but none of them are German. And um, actually, should there be, um, he doesn't see why that should be. There's no reason why German women should be, um, no, no, uh, they should be just as good at, at mathematics as, as, um, as women from other, other nations. Um, and Klein um, supports uh, women studying from America. Um, and uh, we see, um, uh, uh, this is a quote for a letter from, of Mashka uh, talking about Mary Winston. And um, in fact, Mary Winston meets Klein when he goes over to America in 1893 for the first sort of Congress, the kind of pre-Congress to the first International Congress, which takes place in Chicago. And then he gives a series of lectures. And then she goes back to study with him. Charlotte Scott um, 
the, um, who I mentioned earlier. Of course, there was no chance for her to get a professorship in, in Britain at that time. She did have a lectureship at our college um, at Girton in Cambridge, but she is the founding professor at Bryn Mawr, um, and she is actually supported in that by Cayley, the, um, who was the Sadlerian professor of mathematics, um, because her uh, subject was, um, was algebraic geometry, and he, he was really supportive of her. But, um, and so she is also sending um, students to Klein. Um, and I'll sort of skip that. This is um, a list of, of courses where we see who um, Klein's, uh, the women who attended Klein's courses, and anyone who's interested in this, uh, Renata Tobis has done a lot of work on Klein and women, and has written a very interesting paper, and I can give people all the references to that. Um, uh, Klein um, did support women um, in publishing in Mathematica and Arlen. But although note that where I've underlined um, it, the word men appears um, in the uh, title of, the, of, of Mathematics on Ireland. And um, we see Mary Winston, Charlotte Scott, uh, Vera Lipdeva, and Emmy Noether, um, who is the most, uh, unsurprisingly, the most prolific woman who publishes. Um, and that gives me an opportunity to draw attention to an article recently published by Reinhard Sigmund Schulze in the um, London Mathematical Society newsletter, which you can read online, um, which uh, recent uh, discoveries in the archives have shown that uh, the, this resistance to Emmy Noether being given a full professorship in, um, in Kiel in 1928. Um, now, of course, there's been a lot of work done on Emmy Noether, and her life has been well documented, and the, the fact she had to leave Germany under national socialism and so on. But this is an episode that has only recently been uncovered. And again, I think it's quite, um, it, 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 we, we've, reading it from uh, modern eyes, it's really quite shocking that it's considered an experiment. And by, I think, most people's judgment, Emmy Noether was the, the most outstanding woman mathematician of the, um, of the 20th century and one of the outstanding mathematicians per se of the 20th century. Um, looking at um, the United States, um, something a, a, a bit unusual happens in the United States, um, apart from the fact that we have women in the, the book American Men of Science. Um, uh, three women, all of whom um, have associations with Bryn Mawr. We see women having um, uh, doctorates. Um, and Bryn Mawr is sort of like a beacon for women um, at this time, with Charlotte Scott at the helm. She has uh, a number of PhD students. Her successor, Anna Johnson uh, Wheeler, also has a number of PhD students. And Olive Hazlitt, the third woman, uh, or man of science um, was also there. And of course, Emmy Noether was there. Um, but she, um, in emigration, she had only a temporary position. I mean, she wasn't appointed to a permanent position. And of course, she, she dies quite, quite soon afterwards, and um, very unexpectedly and, and, um, and tragically, really. Um, and we see, actually, in this period, before 1940, there are a lot of women getting PhDs, supported by men. Um, at Chicago, there's Dixon and Bliss, um, uh, 30 women between them. Uh, Cornell, Virgil Snyder, 14 women. And, um, and of course, then Bryn Mawr and the Catholic University. Um, but if we look at what happens beyond then, we see this really um, uh, an unexpected graph, I think. Um, so we see the percentage of women getting PhDs going up um, till the um, beginning of the F uh, Second World War, and then after the war it plummets. And the sort of social conditions of the time kind of um, conspire against women to do um, higher mathematics. And of course it's not just math women in mathematics that suffer from this. I mean, this is a, um, a phenomena across, across society. And it's not until really the 1990s that it, it gets back to the same level as it was before the Second World War. So often things are not quite as you would expect when you look at um, the trajectory of, of women in, in mathematics. Um, I want to just mention mathematical societies. What we see in mathematical societies is that actually mathematical societies are very um, welcoming to women, gen uh, generally speaking. I mean, they open their doors um, as soon as they um, start, really. They have uh, no problem about um, having them as members. But when you look at the organizational structures, it's a very different picture. Um, and, and it takes quite some time before we see women actually becoming presidents of uh, mathematical societies get involved in editorial boards and, um, and other committees and so on. So there's this kind of resistance to um, women being within uh, positions where actually they might be able to make a difference. Um, 
So uh, I started by saying um, that women, uh, or the first women's uh, organization for, for women in mathematics was in 1971. On this slide, I've listed, um, there are seven that were established between then and, um, and 1999. Um, and uh, a, an event I just would like to draw attention to, which was the first European Congress of, of Mathematics, where they had a round table on women and mathematics. And this was 1992. So again, not so long ago. And, and the proceedings make very interesting reading. Um, so I've just picked out a couple. This was from um, the, the Dear Sir postcards. So this was from the era of when you um, published mathematics, we didn't have the internet, you got your off prints and you sent them around to your friends. Um, and you had these nice postcards which you just filled in to send um, off to your friends to ask them if you wanted um, a paper and so on. And so this is a comment about the fact that these cards were all printed and there was just no it just wasn't conceived that a woman might actually want one or, or be sending one out. Um, and, um, and then there's also a comment here about really how bad the situation was in Germany at that time, and it was particularly bad. Um, but again, I, I really recommend if you're interested in these issues to, to read the, um, uh, the reports from this round table. Um, and, uh, a survey was done in 1993 and 2005 um, about the number, the percentages of women in mathematics across Europe. And so we can see from this slide here um, how things change. Uh, and it's pleasing to see um, uh, an improvement. Of course, we would hope there would be an improvement, but it's still not very good. But what's quite interesting is seeing how in Southern Europe, actually, the situation is much better than it is in Northern Europe. Um, and we see the same thing if we look at it a little bit more fine-grained and look at, at the uh, professors. Um, again, the situation is, is better in Southern Europe. Um, and one might ask, well, why might that be? Um, and a possible answer, I think, is provided by this rather interesting um, quote from Ingrid Dobyshys, um, which he made um, in 2014 at around the time of um, the last ICM when she was... Um, uh, when she was president of the IMU, um, and she was being interviewed. And, and the question was, there's a common assumption that women are less good than men at mathematics. What could be the reason for this, assuming it's true as well? Um, I disagree with this view completely. There is a highly variable percentage of women in academia and in departments of mathematics across Europe. Differences are so enormous that it becomes obvious that it has something to do with cultural habits, which differ from one nation to another, and not with intelligence. I have a very cynical colleague who says that the number of women mathematicians who are in the, um, academia is inversely proportional to some average of the amount of money and prestige that the job can grant. If there is little money and no prestige, there you will find more women. I agree. These aspects seem to play a much larger role than being smart. And um, my sort of final slide is just to say, um, this is um, to show the increase in the number of organizations for women in mathematics established um, since 2000. Um, and the number is um, still growing, and of course we hope it will grow even more. Um, so thank you very much indeed for your attention. Well, thank you very much, June, for a fascinating talk. And I would love to go on uh, asking questions and telling stories and all sorts of things. Um, but we really need to press on. So I think we won't have any questions now. We'll move on to our next speaker. And then after the talks, we'll have a time for discussion. And then in our social time, um, I have a particular story about how I first heard about Sonia Kovalevska, which I don't think I can repeat at this podium here, but if anyone wants to ask me, um, problems went on into at least the mid 70s. Okay, so um, our next speaker is Sylvina Pons Dawson. Now she's a physicist uh, from the University of Buenos Aires, and she works in biophysics. Now she is a, a member, in fact, a vice president of the International Union 
for pure and applied physics. And she, there are a number of vice presidents. Uh, she has the special title of being gender champion. So she is going to tell us about various activities and perspectives that uh, have been done by the IUPAP, um, its working group on women in physics. So, Selena, thank you. So good evening and thank you, Marie Francoise, for the invitation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are doing at the IUPAP, but since you might not know how we are organized, I'm going to talk about the, the IUPAP a little bit first. So it was established in 1922 and membership is by country. And so it started with very few countries, and now it's 68 countries with representatives with the IUPAP. Uh, the main body of the IUPAP is the General Assembly that gathers once every three years. And then there, are, there is the Executive Committee, and there are commissions by subdiscipline. And then there are working groups that are established to solve specific problems. And in that way was the um, working group on women in physics, was the creation of the working group was decided at the uh, General Assembly in 1999. And so it started to exist in 2000. So we are about to be 20 years old, basically. Um, so the first activities of the working group was first try to survey, so the, the mandate was to survey the situation of women physicists and to suggest ways to improve because there was this perception that there were very few women doing physics all over the world and there were women were finding more difficulties to advance in their careers, etc. So first there was this idea of serving the situation and also then to suggest ways to improve the situation of women physicists. So um, one of the first things that the working group did was to ask the American Institute of Physics, particularly the statistical research group of the AIP, to produce a survey and that was answered by 1,000 women, it was only in English. And then a, another of the um, activities was to organize the first international conference on women in physics. And to do, because that was the idea to bring people from all over the world to present what was the situation in their own countries. And so the way to, to get that done, a, the a working group encouraged the formation of working groups by country, at least countries that were members of IUPAP. And that's the way I got involved, because I was contacted by a Brazilian physicist, Marcia Barbosa, to collect data from Argentina. And until then, I had never thought of the gender issue. I never felt discriminated against. But then when I started to collect the numbers, I realized that there was something. So there was something that had to be solved. Um, so the, all this information was presented at the um, first international conference that took place in Paris at the UNESCO headquarters. There is a, some pictures there. Um, that first conference had the structure of all other conferences because we had now we've already had six conferences, and so there were plenary talks, there were poster presentations with presentations by country, and then there were discussion groups. And from the discussion groups, there were recommendations and what we called resolutions that we wanted to present to the IUPAP General Assembly, so the IUPAP could uphold those recommendations. And so at the conference, we had a final gathering to discuss and there were huge, I mean, very hot discussions because we had very different perspectives depending on where we came from. For example, the issue of having affirmative actions or not, it was something that was very much supported by people from the US and the UK. And I would say that most people from a developing countries, they felt that they didn't want any sort of affirmative thing. But anyway, so it's there that also that I first heard of the old boys club, that the uh, idea of having this network of women was to break 
some structure, some network structure that was kind of in, that women couldn't get into that structure that was it, it was very important meetings outside the workplace, like a meeting to have a beer or something that was mostly boys. Anyway, so among the discussion topics, uh, at that first equip, we called them equip, the international conferences. It was how to attract girls to physics, how to launch a successful physics career, how to get more women to occupy leadership positions, um, how to uh, compare different nations and improve the institutional climate, learning from regional differences and balancing family and career. And so we had all these resolutions and recommendations and the idea of having all these members from different countries, that conference it was attended by over 300 people from more than 64 something like that different countries was that then the uh, country team members should go back to their own countries and try to get things changed in their own countries because at the international level the IUPAP has no power to enforce anything. It could do it for things that are funded by IUPAP or supported by IUPAP but not at the national level of it, its members. And then there were some proceedings published by the American Institute of Physics Publishing Service too uh, that contained papers describing the situation of the different countries that participated of the conference. So um, these are some results from the first survey that was answered by a thousand women. And one of the results was that most, in most cases, people had developed their interest in physics early in their lives. And then one third of the respondents which they were women, further they had progressed more slowly in their careers than their male colleagues. Several of the women said that their career had prevented them from marrying or having children. And I remember that there was a very marked difference depending on the country you came from. Like developed countries, most women were single or didn't have any kids, while women coming from developing countries were married or had been married and had kids. And also, they used to have their kids earlier in their lives compared to women coming from developed countries. And then uh, there was also the, the perception that support from their families was key for their advancement in their careers. And then the, many reports Discriminatory, discriminatory attitudes, and then uh, many people said that they would choose physics anyway, even though they, they had some difficulties. So one thing that we managed to do with the working group was organizing these working groups in many countries, and at some point we had working groups in more countries than IUPAP members. I don't have the pointer here, but this is something to show that, but I'm going to skip. Um, so as I've told you, we've been repeating these international conferences once every three years. So the first one was in Paris. Then we had the other one in Rio in 2005, uh, in Seoul in 2008, in South Africa, Stellenbosch in 2011. And that helped us bring a lot of people from African countries and those country teams, they are still on board with us. Then in Waterloo, Canada in 2014, and the last one was in the UK last year. And we've also had a competition to decide where, where is going to be host, I mean, where is going to take place the next equip is going to be in Australia. And so as I've told you, equip, they give a platform where you could establish different networks. And the thing is, we want people to come from all countries, so we don't want some countries that have much more money to overwhelm the, uh, I mean, to be a majority. And so we put a cap on how many people can participate per country. And if some, and well, we don't put that cap for the local organizers. But the, um, if some country wants to bring more people, then they have to provide funds to fund the uh, travel of people from a developing 
country. And most of, of the activities that we do with the working group is to, to raise a lot of money to fund the travel, to give travel grants for people from developing countries to participate. So, and then uh, now we've reached like some sort of stationary situation in the, the way the equips are organized. We have plenary talks, usually by women, female physicists, that talk about their research and also about their personal lives. Then there is this country poster session where the country teams present the results of their, what is the situation in their countries, how it improved from the previous equip to the present one. Then there is a scientific poster session that started more as like a, an excuse so that people could come to the conference because it's not so easy to go to a conference that I feel it's like more a union-like activity rather than a scientific activity, but we put some science into it. And also because it helps people establish some networking, uh, scientific networks. Then we have also always outreach activities and we've also uh, asked IUPAP to include that in all IUPAP sponsored conferences like the uh, obligation to have some outreach activity and in particular outreach act activities that can change the uh, perception of how physics is done. So to change the perception about women physicists in particular. Then there are these workshops where we discuss the specific gender issues and there is the final assembly where we discuss the, um, the resolutions. And so these are some of the um, issues that we've been discussing lately. Gender studies, improving the workplace, professional development, cultural perception, science edu education, and also networking in the past and balancing family and career. And well, based on our recommendations, the IUPAP has included some things in, in its rules for a conferences, like for example, the uh, outreach activity, or checking that there are women on the committees, of organizing committees among the speakers. We also suggested that women are considered for prices, etc. And, well, this is about the uh, latest equip, and I'm not going to go through the, um, the whole detail. There was an art exhibit that was very interesting that was done with pictures that were provided by the, um, by the um, participants. And one thing that was very interesting was that Malala Yousafzai came to the um, conference and talked, and we all took pictures with her. And, Anyway, uh, we, one problem that we usually have is visas, that sometimes many people from developing countries cannot get the visas done on time, and so that's pretty sad, and we don't know how to solve that. And there were also, these are some pictures from the uh, latest equip, and this, this over here is the working group, and part of the local organizing committee and those are the participants. And one thing that was interesting about this conference was that the uh, last day there were some visits to laboratories that were organized and so that young participants could go visit labs and establish their own networks. These are some more pictures. Here is Malala um, with different things. And, well, as I've told you, from the conference, the uh, country team members are supposed to bring ideas back to their own countries. And we have a web page that is hard to keep updated because I am in charge of that. I don't have so much time for that. But anyway, we try to keep it updated and we have the information on the uh, team members. Um, one thing that we did that was very important was another survey that was the Global Survey of Physicists that was open for responses in 2009. It was also uh, collected and put, set up by the American Institute of Physics Research Statistical Research Group. It was also in eight languages, responded by women and men, and it was responded by about 15,000 people and these are the um, 
the percentages of responses. Um, well, some of the conclusions was again about the early educational experiences was very important. And then the uh, comparing men and women, the uh, personal lives of women were more affected by their careers than the personal lives of men, at least in their own perception. And male physicists were more likely than women to have spouses that didn't work. Um, we had also spouses that earned uh, less than them, and it wasn't that kind of, and also had a not as high education as they did. Well, I, the women that did physics, they were usually married to someone that had a similar kind of degree and a position in which they earned more or less the same. And then um, they, they, there was also all this data about women having harder time getting some uh, opportunities that are very important to advance in their careers, like for example, international opportunities, invitations to speak, supervisory experiences. For example, it was much more likely that women would be uh, supervising undergraduate students and not graduate students. It's like more prestigious things would be left for men mostly. Serve as editor of a journal that would be more difficult for women uh, and advising graduate students. Uh, well, then the, uh, we partnered up with other international unions uh, to do the, uh, this project that involves a survey that is in spirit similar to the one we ran for physicists, but now it's for all disciplines in the natural sciences, plus mathematics and computer science, and we invite you all to respond to it, because we need those responses. And well, these are some pictures from the gender gap, and Marie Francoise is over there, in blue, in the middle. And and well, um, going back to the working group from the IUPAP, another thing that we do is to give out travel grants for women from developing countries to go to schools or conferences outside their own institutions. We don't give that much money, it's up to $800 per person, but um, we go give out quite a bit large amount of grants and we receive very a lot of applications. We, we give them in the years that we don't have equips. When we have the international conference, we put all the money into that. And then we decided to establish an International Women in Physics Day. And we discussed a lot. We thought it was going to be November 7th. That was the uh, birthday of Marie Curie. But the, um, the, it was also something, the International Day of Medical Physicists, I don't know. Anyway, so we decided to choose the same day that the uh, UN chose for the International Day for Girls and Women in Science, that is February 11th, that it was chosen completely arbitrarily. And it's not the best in South America because it's summer and it's vacation time. In Chile, it's vacation time. In Argentina, it's semi-vacation time, but anyway. So, but we, we participated of some sort of virtual activities trying to promote a, that, the day and we expect to fully launch it next year and to have a new logo and stuff. So to do something special about women in physics together with women in science and girls in science. Then, well, the, the IUPAP also created this position of gender champion that was I am the second gender champion. The previous one is, was a physicist from Brazil, Alinka. Um, and the gender champion is the, it's, her duty, it's been to women so far, is to uh, suggest things to the executive committee and also to check that all the gender related policies that are decided by the IUPAP are actually enforced. Like, for example, the uh, rules for conferences that we have like a minimum of 10% uh, women on committees and speakers, but the uh, desired target is of at least 20% women. And 
The thing is, we are not completely certain how to enforce this, because it's true that in some sub-disciplines, maybe you don't have this percentage of women, but we are trying to make a change there. And there's also, well, these are some reports that I'm, I think I'm going to skip with some numbers. Um, there is another thing about the uh, rules for conferences. It's a rule uh, for to handle harassment cases. So now, when you organize a conference that is sponsored by the IUPAP, you need to have someone that is going to deal with any problem of harassment. And so people that participate of the conference need to know that there is this person. and. The IUPEP has not set up a like a basic like guidelines for people to know how to handle this. So, but we are expecting to have something like that. And there is another thing that the um, uh, well, this is the, the statement about harassment. And so, the uh, all the the conference has to have that on the website and on and all the. Uh, uh, published things to have some statement saying that it's not going to be accepted and that it can even end with the, um, the person that did something wrong to be expelled from the uh, conference. And another thing that we also, that has been approved is to have some, what we call an inclusive session that a, well that was I guess before, anyway. Um, an inclusive session in conferences, so to have a, part a special session devoted to discussing how to be more inclusive, not just from the uh, gender perspective, but from all sorts of perspectives. Finally, uh, we are, f we've sort of in fin finalized writing what we call it the Waterloo Charter, because we started it in Waterloo, Canada. This has been inspired by something that the American Astronomical Society has done, is the uh, Pasadena Charter and the uh, Baltimore Charter. And it's basically like a, said a statement saying that we support equal opportunities and stuff like that, and that it ends with a list, list of recommendations on how you could advance with that. And, okay. So, well, this is sort of the, um, a summary. Um, creating the working group, the IUPAP recognized that there was a problem. And this existence of the working group in the IUPAP brought the issue up front and so it made the physics community aware of this problem. And many of the actions of the working group led to the creation of this network of women all over the world. Now, there's still much more needs to be done. Um, so that's why the IUPAP is so deeply involved with the uh, Gender Gap in Science project. And well, we all have to be part of this effort to, for things to get changed. So thank you. So thank you very much, Sylvina. I think to be fair, let's not ask specific questions of you either, but we'll ju just move on to general discussion. It's very interesting to see the uh, comparison between the stories in mathematics and physics. It's kind of similar, but not quite the same trajectory, but somehow tending towards the same, same end. So let us thank all our speakers again uh, for a very interesting talk. And we have uh, about 15 minutes uh, for some discussion. 25. Right, so I don't know, um, will you be able to bring a microphone to people? Who have it? Yeah, okay. So um, if you have a comment or a question on anything, please um, raise your hand. It's a little hard to see up here with the light, so please, who's going to set the ball rolling? 
I'm sure we have things to discuss. Okay, yeah? Um, yeah? Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Hello. Could you, before you say something, could you stand up and say who you are and where you're from? That would help us. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, but this is not good for shy people. I would like, <laughs> but well, I'm standing up. So I, my name is Juan Pablo Vigno. I come from Chile originally, but now I'm in France. And um, well, uh, something else. Well, I'm doing a PhD in mathematics. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I had a, I have a question about this so-called like gender gap paradox. I don't know if you have heard about this, surely, because it's kind of something, a favorite topic of these reactionary people that, that, that say, well, you have these developed countries or the so-called like good countries, I don't know. And then there you have like more like civic equality, but then systematically the percentage of women that you find in science is l kind of less than in some developing countries that are sometimes perceived as like, like le in generally less equal. For example, so you will find more women in mathematics in Saudi Arabia than in Sweden, for example, in, in, as a percentage. And so, but apparently it's kind of systematic that the interest of women in all these countries tend to go more for like literary careers than mathematical careers. But then in some countries, like these developing ones, more women actually choose mathematical careers. And in others, like Nordic countries, more women choose these other careers. So the peop some people say, well, this just means that when you have more, uh, like women can choose like more because they don't have like social restrictions, they, go, they don't go for math, they go for other things. Okay, can I maybe come back on that? Okay, no, 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 I take your point. I understand, no, 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 we want to have discussion from many people. No, 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 no. Okay, I understand what you're saying. I think we had a slide in June's talk, what Ingrid Dobushis said, precisely, well, that, that is one answer to this question. We used to have a lot of arguments about this issue um, in a group I was in in Warwick, um, 35 years ago, I think that the, the number of women is often in, in science is often in proportion to the prestige and the money of such a career. That's one thing. So in the countries where there are a lot of women, you tend to find that the prestige and the income from such a position is probably less, not always. The other thing is that in a number of developing countries, um, women have much more access, well, sort of middle class, better off women have much easier access to domestic help. It is much cheaper in comparison to income mm -hmm. to get people to come in and clean the house, do errands, childcare. In the developed countries, I mean the UK, childcare is phenomenally expensive. So I think those are quite big sociological factors and I think Ingrid is exactly right that you should not attribute this difference necessarily to the interest of women. There's a further thing which we initiated some very interesting discussions a long time ago in, again in Warwick that actually the religious differences like Catholic, Protestant, I don't know about um, Arab countries but Catholic versus Protestant, the society being sort of a bit more matriarchal or patriarchal, um, those also have differences. So there are a lot of sociological factors. So I don't know if anybody else would like to come back on that. Yeah. So. Okay. So, but despite so, uh, of what's the starting point, so what's the percentage of women that study or choose physics or mathematics or another science, something that you see everywhere, both in developing and developed countries, is what we, you could call the uh, glass ceiling. If you look at the percentage of women in the lowest stages of the academic career, 
that percentage is sort of similar to that of the uh, students of that discipline. But then if you advance along the uh, academic career, that percentage drops. And last year, there was this professor in Cambridge that showed the numbers in Cambridge in physics, comparing physics with sociology, that if you think of going from lower to higher level, so from left to right, so your starting point is the lower level, in sociology was much larger the percentage of women. And then when you reach at the highest positions, it was similar to physics. So sociology was even worse than physics. So there is this thing about the, the advancement of women, that we lose women on their way to in their careers, and that it's much more difficult for women to advance. And that happens everywhere, developed and developing countries. All right, let's have any other comments on that issue or, or anyone like to raise another point? Hello. Um, I would like to know if you... Would you, you like to tell us where you're from? And, you yeah, know? I'm yeah. from Uruguay. Um, I would like to know if you see differences in different areas of physics or in mathematics. Um, because we were discussing on Tuesday mm. that uh, some areas maybe are perceived diffi more difficult or for genius, and maybe there's correlation between the number of women in these areas. Uh, I don't know. Do, do you see something similar in physics? Can I also say something about that? I, I think in my observation, um, I don't know quite about now, but the number of women in a particular field of mathematics seems to me to be incredibly dependent on the having been a sort of major figure at some point in the past who supported female mathematicians. Now this major figure was very likely not, not a female. So an example would be Lippmann Bears. You will find a lot of women in kind of subjects that have derived Teichmuller theory and so on. Um, through, because he had a lot of women students or he supported them. Um, actually, almost an example is, is Charlotte Scott, who became the first female with a position of, of kind of influence and power in Bryn Mawr College. We saw in June's talk how many women students she kind of sponsored and she sort of provided a generation of further women PhDs. I think I'm right, yeah, even back then. So, and, and then you see, um, say in the University of Chicago at some point, some professor comes in who really, you know, thinks women are hopeless, and the numbers just drop. So uh, maybe more than the subject, it's the influence of, of very influential people that, that count somehow. So uh, I don't have statistics of that. It's my own perception, so it could be biased. But I think that they are like the yeah, high energy physics and cosmology try to explain the origin of the universe or well, try to be like Einstein, I would say, that is mostly male dominated, uh, but not quite. Like for example, the detection of the gravitational waves when they were detected for the first time, the spokesperson was an Argentinian woman, Gabriela Gonzalez. So. It's not exactly like that. Then I thought that maybe there was a difference between theoretical and experimental physics, mostly because experiments, you cannot accommodate so easily your, your schedule. Your, it's not that you could do the experiments anywhere at any time. You have to do them at the lab particular times. And so if you have to a, compatibilize your work and your life and you have kids and stuff, then it's more difficult to do experimental work. So I thought that maybe more women were doing more a theoretical work that you could do at, at home uh, with a computer that you don't need uh, to go to the lab. But there are, at least in Argentina, there are lots of women doing experiments. So I don't know if that's the case. I, I don't have statistics, though. It's my perception. I I have at least, so my name is Ingrid Dobshi. I, I am a mathematician, 
Uh, you, you, uh, yeah. um, I um, and I'm from the U.S. I'm based in the U.S. I'm originally from Belgium. Um, I have anecdotally uh, observed, and I, it would be interesting to actually see, and maybe you'll see that from the results of the gender gap study. But I, we, we all know that in mathematics, and I believe in physics as well, there are subfields that are more congenial to young people to, and others that are much more aggressive. Uh, actually, I first started thinking about this when somebody in, 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 in my field, applied functional analysis, uh, came over from a different field and remarked on it to me. He says, you are all remarkably nice to each other. He says, I come from another field where they eat their young. I mean, uh, now, he was exaggerating, but uh, I wonder whether there's a correlation between numbers of women in fields and that more congenial atmosphere. I think there is. I don't know whether it's causal or, I mean, uh, but I, I think there is. And I think, I think it would be very interesting to actually look at that statistically. Let me say something that is sort of related, because many times we discuss how to get more women into the field, and sometimes it's like we have to empower young women to be able to act somehow in the way that uh, they are more valued, something, because there is like a standard of what you expect of a scientist, and so there are some aspects that are more valued than others, and so how to teach them to behave in a way that they are perceived that they are very good at, at this and that. But I think that it's best to think the other way around, which is a put value to other, to other features that may be a more congenial kind of doing science, not so competitive. And so I think that we should be thinking of how to bring more women and change a little bit the way that the sociology of the uh, science community, I would say. Hi, my name is Birgit Richter, I'm from Germany and I'm a mathematician, a professional mathematician. Uh, we are all talking about role models, we are talking about women who should give talks and should be role models for young female mathematicians. But when I look at this conference and I see the prices that are given and there are no women receivers, I'm appalled. And prices for women are a very important thing and I don't see any initiative to increase the percentage of women who receive prestigious prizes. We see a lot of initiatives where we have special prizes created for women and I'm not sure how I should feel about this. But at this conference I'm, I'm not very happy how things are going and are there any initiatives that try to push the IMU towards acknowledging female research. I mean, everybody here knows several young female mathematicians with outstanding research results during the last years. And I'm just missing their names on the prize panels here. Okay, so I think that, that there are, uh, well, probably Ingrid can tell you more about it, but uh, there are certainly efforts for having more women speaking at the ICM. And this is, of course, not like uh, getting a prize, but certainly the panels are uh, kind of encouraged to have more, uh, uh, more invited speakers, which are female. And we've seen also that after all the actions made essentially by the uh, Association for Women in Mathematics in the US, there was a change in the 90s. And now we have about 15% of uh, 
female lecturers at uh, this ICM, for example, and it was already more or less the same proportion at, at Seoul. It's obvious that in terms of prize, I mean, getting prizes, I mean, we've seen the example yesterday that there were eight prizes and absolutely no women, but uh, I'm not personally involved in this uh, prizes committee, but each committee is kind of independent. We've seen that there were women inside the committees, a kind of reasonable proportion of women inside the committees, like three women, for example, for the field medalist committee. And also, well, I don't know, I mean, Caroline was uh, <laughs> chair of one of these committees, for example, so maybe you can tell a little about, you know, but about your experience, and because it's true that we, we don't know how to, to influence that for the moment, so. I, I could say one thing, which is, I think, uh, it's very important to nominate people for prizes, men or women. I mean, people don't get a prize unless they, with most prizes, unless they're nominated. And so if you believe in an outstanding woman or man or anything, you need to nominate them. Or if you don't feel you can, you need to go around and, and talk to other people until you identify someone who feels they know enough and feels confident enough to do it. So I would really urge that. Um, you know, uh, you'd be quite surprised some of these prize, big prizes um, actually don't, uh, I'm, not just, I'm not particularly talking about the IMU prizes, they don't receive all that many nominations. It's kind of an effort. But, you know, if you see there are women out there who you think deserve a certain prize at a certain level, well, you know, it's on all of you and to do something about it. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm Barbara Tumpak, I'm a geometer from France. So I would like to react to this because uh, if you look uh, carefully, uh, yesterday at, on stage there were five women. But you, you haven't noticed them. There were four from the staff mm -hmm. and one woman representing the bank, the sponsor of, of this IMC. Mm -hmm. And if you think a little bit of the image that this gives to all the um, gold medalists in, in blue shirts that were uh, uh, on, on the, uh, in this room at that time. So they see um, four women uh, from, from staff certainly do a very good job, but who are not the ones who have pr prize there, and one woman which is a, a sponsor of a bank. So, I mean, the image is not right uh, for women, I would say. So, this is something mm. that we have to think about. Mm. The image that we, uh, we give to the young people, uh, well, there is some work to do. Yeah. <clears throat> well, in I agree entirely. Well, in Seoul, we had a picture, famous picture, where there were three women on the stage, Ingrid, who was the chair of IMU. At that time, uh, the, the, um, um, so I don't know if she, she was president, or I don't know, I mean, the, the leader of, the, of Korea was a woman who maybe is in jail now. <laughs> and the third one was... Uh, uh, Mariam Nyasakani was uh, unfortunately uh, dead. So this image is an image I, I was really uh, loving a lot, but it's true that it was maybe some exceptional moment. We are not yet at the situation where it's becoming something uh, usual. Huh? From staff also. So why putting three or four women from staff and not men. I understand what you are saying. I'm just saying that when the same ceremony in Seoul had a very different uh, character. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, we have time. Just one or two more quick questions and then I, we'll I don't, I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying that there was a big difference for those who were in Seoul. And I mean, I, I'm very depressed by what happened yesterday. I mean, because uh, in Seoul, it was, it was not the same. But, uh, hmm? 
So, so, so I, want, I want to make a comment on what was said. I, I completely disagree that the committees are, are balanced. Um, and I think uh, for the prices, is, is we cannot force a certain number of women. I don't think that would be uh, good. But for the committees, we, we could force a, a, ba a balanced representation. And, and that, that would make, I think, would help. Or, or, um, but I feel, um, personally, I feel when you saw the list of the various committees for this IMU, I mean, I know it's not 50-50, but I mean, let's be reasonable in the representation of, of, of women who are at the sufficient level to be on such a committee, it is not 50-50. So I, I, I personally, I disagree with you. I think they have made a large amount of effort to put women on these committees. Um, several committees either had chairs this, this time around or have had ch women chairs in the past. So, And you also have to think, this historical issue is the, the generation of, say, Ingrid or myself, who are now sort of in these senior roles, in our generation, there were not very many women. I mean, I feel I was one of the first generation of women who were able to proceed with no institutional barriers at all, and no sort of nepotism rules, and I had access to the library, and et cetera, et cetera. This is only very recent. So you have to give, I, I feel this is why June's talk is so important. I, personally, I feel that the IMU and many other bodies, the London Mathematical Society, are making great efforts, and you shouldn't put 50-50 on committee. You will kill the women who are in a position to be on these committees if you try to make it 50-50. It, it's not sort of reasonable in my view. I appreciate what you said, that we need to nominate people for committees. So what we would like to know is how we do this and how we can be organized about nominating women for prizes and for committees and for other honors and for sitting on the stage. Um, I, I, I agree that it's very important. I'm, involved with the AWM we, uh, Scientific Advisory Committee. We would like to ask your help, in fact. We would like to see women being represented more among prize winners and positions such as um, fellows of the AMS, fellows of SIAM. And it really does take nominating them because even women don't think of other women as easily as they think of prominent men, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm not asking that it be 50-50, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying if we can have initiatives and efforts that mm -hmm. we can do, and if we can ask the societies to make clear what a nomination procedure would involve and guide us in how to do this and perhaps say what the deadline would be, some, some nominating committees, perhaps it isn't as appropriate as others, but perhaps we can make some headway on that. No, thank you. Oh, and I'm Sylvia yeah. Wiegand, sorry. Would you like to, I was the would you like to tell us Grace who, Chisholm Young. <laughs> Sylvia's yeah. grandmother was Grace Chisholm Young, who June mentioned in her talk, who was the first, am I right, June, the first, no, I've mixed up. She, she, she was the first um, woman PhD but if you discount oh, no, Covenant Sky from the... We don't hear you. Okay, you need a mic. It's on. It's on. Okay. Um, yes, so, um, yes, Grace Chisholm was the first woman PhD in, in, in mathematics. Um, Covenant Sky is, was a slightly different case because she didn't, um, she didn't study in Göttingen where she got the PhD. So, I, I, I think... Is generally accepted um, that, she, that she, she was, was the only the first woman to receive a PhD in any field in Germany in 1895, yeah. and she especially had to go and request from the ministry where they did this to have this take the regular exam and go through the procedure. So Sonia Kavalevskaya had received a PhD. 
that was in Incepsia, in absentia. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, so I, let's I, give I've... a let's give a round of applause to the memory of Grace Chisholm Young. Let's also get nominations. <laughs> okay. I think Sylvie. So I, I, wa I wanted to say something about women on committees because sometimes that's not a warranty of anything. There is this study that was published in PNAS in 2012 uh, with this experiment that they had sent out 120 P uh, CVs. They were identical, they only differed in the name. One of them was John, whatever, the other one was. Jocelyn, whatever, and they sent those CVs identical to 120 labs, and John received many more offers, job offers, mentoring opportunities, higher salary than Jennifer, it was not Jocelyn. And so there are all these biases, these unconscious biases, because that was on paper, it was exactly the same. And who had those biases? It was equally likely that women and men faculty would have that. So it was a, John was preferred both by men and women. So there has to be something, a very, a, put some energy into making a change. I was, Last year, this equip it was at a unconscious bias training thing or whatever, and some people were saying that well, you could have like a person on the committee that is just trying to see that there are no biases and stuff like that, and some other people were saying that maybe it's good to separate different minorities or groups or whatever and ordered, like for example, ordered women candidates and then ordered main candidates and then try to merge them. And so you turn to, to look at those people without turning them down because of these biases that we are all, I mean, we, are, we all have them, but how to change them. Okay, I think if we want to have any time for our social part of the evening, we should stop now. Um, can I remind you all, um, for those who haven't seen it, about the beautiful memorial to Maria Mirzakhani, which is in the uh, downstairs here. And in particular, there is a book of condolences in which you are invited to write your thoughts, memories of Mariam. So uh, let us now, maybe we can give another round of applause for our speakers. And <laughs>